Chapter 1 John Wilkes Booth awoke depressed. It was Good Friday morning, April 14th, 1865. The Confederacy was dead. His cause was lost and his dreams of glory over. He did not know that this day, after enduring more than a week of bad news, he would enjoy a stunning reversal of fortune. No, all he knew this morning when he crawled out of bed was that he could not stand another day of Union victory celebrations. Booth assumed that the day would unfold as the latest in a blur of days that had begun on April 3rd when the Confederate capital, Richmond, fell to the Union. The very next day, the tyrant Abraham Lincoln had visited his captive prize and had the nerve to sit behind the desk occupied by the first and last president of the Confederate States of America, Jefferson Davis. Then, on April 9th, at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, General Robert E. Lee and his beloved Army of Northern Virginia surrendered. Two days later, Lincoln had made a speech proposing to give blacks the right to vote. And last night, April 13th, all of Washington had celebrated with a grand illumination of the city. These days had been the worst of Booth's young life. Twenty-six years old, impossibly vain, an extremely talented actor, and a star member of a celebrated theatrical family, John Wilkes Booth was willing to throw away fame, wealth, and a promising future for the cause of the Confederacy. He was the son of the legendary actor Junius Brutus Booth and brother to Edwin Booth, one of the finest actors of his generation. Handsome and appealing, he was instantly recognizable to thousands of fans in both the North and South. His physical beauty astonished all who saw him. A fellow actor described his eyes as being like living jewels. Booth's passions included fine clothing, southern honor, good manners, beautiful women, and the romance of lost causes. On April 14th, Booth's day began in the dining room of the National Hotel, where he ate breakfast. Around noon, he walked over to nearby Ford's Theater, a block from Pennsylvania Avenue, to pick up his mail. Ford's customarily accepted personal mail as a courtesy to actors. There was a letter for Booth. That same morning, a letter arrived at the theater for someone else. There had been no time to mail it, so its sender, First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln, had used the president's messenger to hand deliver to the owners of Ford's Theater. The mere arrival of the White House messenger told them that the president was coming to the theater tonight. Yes, the president and Mrs. Lincoln would attend this evening's performance of the popular, if silly, comedy, Our American Cousin. But the big news was that General Ulysses S. Grant was coming with them. The Lincolns had given the Fords enough advance notice for the proprietors to decorate and join together the two theater boxes, seven and eight, that, by removal of a partition, formed the president's box at the theater. By the time Booth arrived at the theater, the president's messenger had come and gone. Sometime between noon and 12.30 p.m., as he sat on the top step in front of the entrance to Fords reading his letter, Booth heard the big news. In just eight hours, the man who was the subject of all his hating and plotting would stand on the very stone steps where he now sat. Here, of all places, Lincoln was coming here. Booth knew the layout of Fords intimately. The exact spot on 10th Street where Lincoln would step out of his carriage, the box inside the theater where the president sat when he came to a performance, the route Lincoln could walk, and the staircase he would climb to the box, the dark underground passageway beneath the stage. He knew the narrow hallway behind the stage where a back door opened to the alley, and he knew how the president's box hung directly above the stage. Though Booth had never acted in Our American Cousin, he knew it well. Its lengths, its scenes, its players, and most important, the number of actors on stage at any given moment during the performance. It was perfect. He would not have to hunt Lincoln. The president was coming to him. He had only eight hours to prepare. If luck was on his side, there was just enough time to carry out his plan. Whoever told Booth about the president's plan to attend the play that night had unknowingly activated in his mind an imaginary clock that began ticking down minute by minute. He would have a busy afternoon. Abraham Lincoln ate breakfast with his family and planned his day. The Lincoln's eldest son, Robert, a junior officer of General Grant's staff, was home from the war. Robert had been at the surrender at Appomattox, and his father was eager to hear the details. General Grant joined Lincoln's cabinet meeting later that day where everyone in attendance, including Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton and Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells, noticed Lincoln's good mood. Secretary Wells, who kept a diary, 
wrote that Lincoln had last night the usual dream which he had preceding nearly every great and important event of the war. Lincoln said the dream related to the water, that he seemed to be in some indescribable vessel, and that was moving with great speed towards an indefinite shore. He had this dream preceding the great battles of the Civil War. Lincoln had always believed in, and sometimes feared, the power of dreams. In 1863, while visiting Philadelphia, he sent an urgent telegram to Mary Todd Lincoln at the White House, warning of the danger to their young son. Think you better put Tad's pistol away. I had an ugly dream about him. After the cabinet meeting ended, the president followed his usual routine, receiving visits from friends and job seekers, reading his mail, and catching up on paperwork. He was eager to wind up business by 3 p.m. for an appointment he had with his wife, Mary. There was something he wanted to tell her. At the theater, Henry Clay Ford wrote out the advertisement that appeared that afternoon in the Evening Star. Lieutenant General Grant, President, and Mrs. Lincoln have secured the state box at Ford's Theater tonight to witness Miss Laura Keene's American cousin. James Ford walked to the Treasury Department a few blocks away to borrow several flags to decorate the President's box. On his way back, his arms wrapped around a bundle of brightly colored cotton and silk fabric, he bumped into Booth. They spoke briefly. Booth saw the red, white, and blue flags, further confirmation of the president's visit that night. Dr. Charles A. Leal, a 23-year-old U.S. Army surgeon, was on duty at the Armory Square Hospital in Washington when he heard that President Lincoln and General Grant would be at the performance that night. He decided to attend. Leal wanted, most of all, to catch a glimpse of the famous general who had won the Civil War. Booth rode over to the Kirkwood House, where he accomplished his strangest errand of the day, the Kirkwood was the residence of the new vice president, Andrew Johnson, who was from Tennessee. The job did not include official quarters, so he lived at a hotel. Johnson's room was unguarded, and if Booth had wanted to, he could have walked upstairs and knocked on the door, or worse. But he did not want to see or harm the vice president. He just wanted to leave him a note. Booth approached the front desk, wrote a brief note, and handed it to the desk clerk, who placed it in Johnson's mail slot. The message read, Don't wish to disturb you. Are you home? J. Wilkes Booth. Next, Booth visited a boarding house on H Street, a few blocks from Ford Theater, to pay what looked like an innocent co social call on the owner. Mary Surratt was a 42-year-old Maryland widow and mother of John Harrison Surratt, a Confederate secret agent and friend of Booth's. Over the last several months, Booth had become a frequent caller at Mrs. Surratt's Washington townhouse. Tonight, her son, John, was not home. He was out of the city on rebel business. Mary told Booth that she was riding out that afternoon to her country tavern in Surrettsville, Maryland, several miles south of Washington. Booth asked if she would mind delivering a small package wrapped in newspaper to her tavern. Conveniently, Booth had the package with him. There was one more thing. Booth told Mary that he would be riding out of Washington this evening. Sometime that night, he said, he would stop at her tavern to pick up not only this package, but also the guns, ammunition, and other supplies that her son John had already hidden there for him. He asked Mary to tell the tavern keeper, John Lloyd, to get everything ready for the actor's visit this evening. She agreed, and soon she and Louis Weichman, one of her boarders, drove down to Surrettsville by carriage. At some point that afternoon, Booth made the final arrangements. There were two types of preparation, practical and mental. First, the weapons. Booth chose his a, as his primary weapon a 44 caliber single-shot muzzle-loading pistol manufactured by Henry Derringer of Philadelphia. It was a small, short-barreled, pocket-sized handgun designed for concealment, not combat. Its big 44 caliber ball, weighing in at nearly an ounce, was a solid, deadly round. Unlike military pistols that could fire up to six rounds before reloading, the Derringer could be fired just once. Reloading was a time-consuming process that called for two hands and more than 20 seconds. Booth knew that his first shot would be his last. If he missed, he wouldn't have time to reload. Booth left behind no explanation for why he chose the Derringer over a revolver. Pistols misfire occasionally. Either the copper percussion cap might fail to spark, or the black powder in the barrel might fail to ignite because of dampness. Booth was a thrill seeker, so perhaps he wanted to increase his excitement by risking the use of a one-shot pistol. Or did he believe it more heroic, more honorable, even more gentlemanly, to take his prey with a single bullet? Perhaps he preferred a stylish single shot to blazing away with a six-shooter. Then if he missed or failed to kill the president, he would turn to his backup weapon, a Rio Grande camp knife, 
a handsome and extremely sharp type of bowie knife. Before leaving the National Hotel, Booth slid the knife and pistol into his pants and gathered the rest of his belongings. He planned to travel light that night. In addition to the weapons in his clothing, a black felt slouch hat, black wool cap, black pants, big knee-high black leather riding boots with spurs, he only took a velvet-cased compass, keys, a whistle, a date book, a pencil, some money, a small knife, and a few other items, including small photographs of five of his favorite girlfriends. When Mary Surratt and her boarder arrived in Surrettsville, the tavern keeper, John Lloyd, wasn't there. He had left on an errand. Mary waited for him. When Lloyd returned, he parked his wagon, climbed down, and began unloading his cargo of fish and oysters. Mary delivered the message to the tavern keeper, John Lloyd. I want you to have those shooting irons ready. There will be parties here tonight who will call for them. She handed him Booth's package wrapped in newspaper. The evening callers will want this too, she explained. And, she added, give them a couple bottles of whiskey. Her mission accomplished, Mary and Louis drove back to Washington. Lloyd followed Mary's instructions. He carried the package upstairs, unwrapped it, and discovered Booth's binoculars. He went to a room where, several weeks ago, John Surratt had shown him how to hide two Spencer carbines between the wall. Lloyd retrieved them and placed them with the binoculars in his bedchamber. At the Herndon House Hotel, around the corner from Ford's, at around 8 p.m., Booth presided over a meeting of some of the conspirators he had recruited over the previous months to strike against President Lincoln. This was not the first time they had assembled to move against the president. They had failed at least once before. Beginning in 1864, Booth, the young stage star, had pledged his cash, his celebrity, and his connections in hatching a bold plan. He put together a harebrained scheme to kidnap President Lincoln, take him to Richmond, and hold him as a hostage for the Confederacy in an effort to help win the war for the South. From the time of Lincoln's election in 1860, there arose several conspiracies to kidnap or murder him. Pro-secession, pro-Southern rebels began mailing death threats to Lincoln before he took office in 1861. Some even sent him jars of poisoned fruit. In one notorious plot of 1861, local rebels schemed to assassinate the president-elect when his railroad train passed through Baltimore on the way to Washington for his first inauguration. But Detective Allen Pinkerton ruined the scheme by persuading Lincoln to pass through the city in disguise several hours ahead of schedule. Other Lincoln haters threatened to assassinate him on the east front of the Capitol the moment he began to read his inaugural address. During the Civil War, several Southern military officers, as well as a handful of officials in the Confederate Secret Service, considered plots against Lincoln. But big talk was cheap in wartime Washington. As late as January 1865, with the Confederacy in danger of collapse at any moment, not one of the conspiracies resulted in serious action against Abraham Lincoln. At some point, John Wilkes Booth came into contact with sympathetic secret agents in Canada, New York City, Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. In late 1864 and early 1865, Booth organized his own little band of conspirators loyal to him and not the Confederacy. He recruited a gang who, after he clothed and fed them, paid for their food and drink, allowed them to enjoy the benefits of his fame and favor, would, he hoped, follow him anywhere, even into a plot to kidnap the President of the United States. Booth and his gang of conspirators, Lewis Powell, David Harold, John Harrison Surratt, and George Atzerodt, as well as Samuel Arnold, Michael O'Laughlin, and others who drifted in and out of his circle, would change cheap talk to big action by kidnapping the president. On March 17, 1865, Booth and his henchmen planned, like highway robbers, to ambush Lincoln's carriage at gunpoint on a deserted road as he rode home to the executive mansion. They would make Lincoln their hostage. Booth's information was incorrect, however, and Lincoln did not arrive as expected. Instead, unbelievably, while Booth and his gang lay in wait on the road on the outskirts of the city, Lincoln was giving a speech at Booth's own hotel, the National. If only the kidnapping plot had worked, there would have been no torchlight parades, no crowds serenading Lincoln at the executive mansion, no little children scampering through the streets with paper flags with red, white, and blue stars and stripes. Although his panicked gang scattered after that ridiculous failure, Booth hoped to try again. But events unfolded quickly when, 18 days later, Richmond fell and then General Lee surrendered. Lincoln's April 11th speech provoked more violent talk. The president's proposal for a limited black citizenship and voting rights enraged the racist actor. But Booth did nothing. 
If he was serious about assassinating Lincoln, all he had to do was stroll over to the executive mansion, announce that the famous actor John Wilkes Booth wished to see the president, await his turn, which nearly always resulted in a private talk with Lincoln, and then shoot Lincoln at his desk. But that would have been a suicide mission. It would have been difficult to escape the White House. Incredibly, presidential security was very weak in that era, even during wartime. Almost anyone could walk into the executive mansion without being searched and request a brief meeting with the president. It was a miracle that no one had yet tried to murder Lincoln in his own office. Booth would soon turn his anger and violent talk into action. Now, April 14, 1865, Booth assembled enough men to accomplish another mission. Booth proposed, aspiring kidnapper George Atzerodt recalled, that we should kill the president. It would, said Booth, be the greatest thing in the world. Tonight, at exactly 10 p.m., Booth and his henchmen would throw into chaos the Union government by killing its top leaders. That would, they hoped, incite the Confederacy to continue the war against the Union. George Atzerodt, Lewis Powell, and John Wilkes Booth would strike simultaneously and murder Vice President Johnson, Secretary of State Seward, and President Lincoln. Atzerodt's assignment was to assassinate the Vice President in his room at the Kirkwood House. You must kill Johnson, Booth told him. Lewis Powell would murder Secretary of State Seward. Seward was certain to be in bed that night, recovering from a serious carriage accident. David Harold, an experienced outdoorsman, hunter, and tracker, would accompany Lewis Powell and take him to Seward's home and guide the assassin, unfamiliar with the Capitol's streets, out of the city where he would meet up with Booth. Booth pl- claimed the most notorious part in the plot for himself. He would slip into Ford's theater and assassinate the president during the play. Powell and Harold, Booth's two most loyal pals, agreed to the plan. Atzerodt had doubts about his assignment. He would not do it, he said. Booth then threatened Atzerodt, implying that he might as well kill Johnson because if he didn't, Booth would accuse him anyway and get him hanged. None of Booth's conspirators knew it, but Booth had already implicated all of them. He had entrusted a sealed envelope to a friend and fellow actor who was to see that the letter it contained was published tomorrow in the newspaper. In the letter, not only did Booth justify the triple assassination, but he signed his henchmen's names to the document as well, sealing their fates. Atzerodt's reluctant to kill Johnson put the whole plot at risk. Atzerodt knew the details of the assassination plan that was unfolding. If he left that meeting and went to the police, Booth, Powell, and Harold would be finished. Guards would rush to protect those threatened in the plot, and the conspirators would be hunted down. Booth would fail in his mission. At the executive mansion, the Lincolns were behind schedule. It was past 8 p.m., and they still had not gotten into their carriage. As the curtain rose at Ford's, the coachman and Lincoln's servant, Charles Forbes, were on top of the carriage. The Lincoln's private afternoon carriage ride and absence from the mansion had left business unfinished, with several politicians still waiting for an audience with the president. Earlier that afternoon, Lincoln was happy to be free of the politicians and the burdens of his office. It had been one of the happiest days of his life. At breakfast, son Robert told tales of Lee's surrender. For once, the cabinet meeting was free of crises, battle news, and problems requiring the president's immediate attention. Since Lee's surrender, Lincoln had been more cheerful than at any other time during his presidency. He expected more good news about the surrender of additional Confederate armies. He wanted to ride alone with Mary on this day. She had been emotionally upset since the death of their 11-year-old son, Willie, in 1862. They both took the loss hard, but Abraham Lincoln recovered and Mary did not. It was hard to lose the boy, he said. He organized Willie's funeral, then he threw himself into his work. Mary was, at heart, a kind woman, but some critics preferred to criticize her personal quirks, her expensive shopping habits, her jealous temper, rather than praise her good works for soldiers or her absolute loyalty to husband, liberty, and the Union cause. The demands of the war had been so great that the president spent less and less time with Mary. Lincoln knew that he had to change that now that the war was ending. He wanted to talk to Mary about their future. He walked her to the open carriage, his good mood impossible to miss. Mary Todd Lincoln had noticed his recent optimism and now, during their afternoon carriage ride, she spoke to him about it. Dear husband, you almost startle me by your great cheerfulness. Lincoln replied, we must both be more cheerful in the future. Between the war and the loss of our darling Willie, We have both been very miserable. During their leisurely ride, the president told his wife that they must try to be happy again, that he would like to see the Pacific Ocean, 
that perhaps at the end of his second term in office, they would move to Chicago and he would practice law again. Freed from the troubles of war and death, he would send no more armies of young men to die, Lincoln dreamed of the future. Many later remembered, I never saw him so supremely cheerful. His manner was even playful. That evening, when the Lincolns finally left the White House for Fords, they picked up their guests. General Grant and his wife had declined Lincoln's invitation and boarded a train headed home instead. Several other couples had also declined the invitation, but Major Rathbone, an army officer, and his fiancée, Clara Harris, accepted. At 8 p.m., the management at Fords decided not to hold the curtain for the presidential party, and the play began without them. Soon, an employee acting as lookout at Fords spotted the big black carriage turning down 10th Street. It slowed to a stop beside the wood platform in front of the theater, constructed especially to assist carriage riders in getting out of their vehicles and avoiding the muddy street. The Lincolns, Henry Rathbone, and Clara Harris exited the carriage. The chief usher escorted them through the lobby, up the winding staircase, and across the first balcony to their theater box. Abraham Lincoln's entry to Ford's Theater at 8.30 on April 14, 1865, was majestic and simple. He arrived with no crowd of guards or staff and no announcement to the audience. Before the presidential party reached the box, the actors, musicians, and theater goers became aware of the Lincoln's arrival. The actors on stage stopped performing. To the delight of the crowd, the conductor led his orchestra in Hail to the Chief, the traditional music accompaniment to the entrance of the president. Dr. Charles Leal, seated in the front of the first balcony, about 40 feet from the president's box, had arrived in time to witness it all. He watched the audience rise to its feet in enthusiasm and cheer. He looked around, too, and watched as Lincoln looked upon the people he loved and acknowledged them with a solemn bow. At this supreme moment, the people cheered the man who, after a shaky start in office, learned how to command armies, brought down slavery, and became a most eloquent and moving speaker. And as he promised he would, he had saved the Union. Lincoln stood in the box and bowed to the audience. The outpouring emotion from the audience and orchestra, the hissing gaslights, the packed house, the fresh, moist scent of spring in the air, the recent and happy news from the army, all combined to make a magical moment.